Okay, then let's move on over to our message today. We are in the book of Acts as we are studying uh, how God began to move in the church so that the people of God who had looked at the world through a certain set of blinders, through a particular grid, God moved so that his people were able to expand their view of how he was working in the world. Remember, if you were Jewish, you had a special covenant with God. God's intent from the beginning is that the Jewish people would be a beacon of light to the nations. But as the nations saw that light, they did not have to become Jewish. That's clear. You look at Naaman the leper. When uh, he, he said, I'm going to worship the true God from now on to Elisha. And he said, but obviously, you know, I just need some dirt so I can, I can uh, you know, worship the true God on some Isra- Israel soil and forgive me for having to bow down in the temple of Rimmon with my master when I hold his arm. And, and all of these things that Naaman were, was doing and talking about would have been a violation for anybody under the first co- the Jewish covenant. It would have been a violation for them because the idea of sacrificing on a dirt pit of dirt from Drew, a priest sacrificed. And, and, uh, but Gentiles, non-Jewish people, were never under the, the covenant of Moses. They could still approach God in the way that Job did. Job was probably a contempor- contemporary of Abraham. That's what we assume the dating is. You know, and, and living in a different part of the world. And he had a relationship with the true God that had nothing to do with Abraham. It was God working with Gentiles. Uh, Melchizedek, again, was someone who was, you know, worshiping the true God. It was obvious when Moses was leading the people of Israel that the priest of Midian, his father-in-law, was also a worshiper of the true God. None of them, though, had to come under the covenant that God had given the Jewish people. And, I mean, at that time, Moses had ignored the covenant of circumcision for his kids, probably because he was living with his father-in-law and they didn't do circumcision. And so God had to confront him on the way back to Egypt to, de- to deliver the Israelites because he was not, he was under the covenant. <laughs> and his father-in-law wasn't under the covenant, but he was because he was a, a member of the, the Jewish people. And his kids were under the covenant as that same, for that same reason. So uh, down through history, though, this is what happened. Because you have a special place in God's plan, often you begin to narrow your view to think that you're the only one with a place in God's plan. And that's something we have to protect ourselves from always, and it's something which by the time that Jesus came onto the earth and the time the disciples were going out with the mission, Um, it's something that had become so close that they didn't even look at reaching out to the Gentiles. It just wasn't something that was important to them. If the Gentiles were interested, they would come become proselytes of the gate or proselytes of righteousness. They would either come in and, you know, identify with the Jewish people somehow, or they would actually become people who voluntarily came under the Jewish law. And that was basically the picture of how it needed to be done. And God needed to do something more to help the church shift gears. So, today we are in a part of the book of Acts where Peter starts to have some major realizations that God doesn't show favoritism to different nations. God doesn't discriminate based upon race. God has always been an equal opportunity God. Why? Because he's the one that created everyone. And he loves all people. So today our theme in uh, Acts chapter 10 is following the God who doesn't discriminate. Now when I say discriminate, he certainly does discriminate between good and evil. He discriminates between justice and injustice and those sort of things. But he doesn't discriminate between people based upon their ethnicity, their backgrounds, or you know, where they came from. That's not, they all came from Adam and Eve. Or they all came from Moses, Moses and his kids. And so, not Moses, Noah and his kids. And so they, uh, they were um, definitely uh, 
God is the one who built this thing. So we are in Acts chapter 10. We're in the second half of verse 23. Some of your translations may not even have the second half of verse 23. I knew the New American Standard Version doesn't, and I still haven't figured out why they don't have it, but oh well. I looked. I couldn't find their reasoning. But anyway, Acts chapter 10, second half of verse 23. On the next day, this is talking about Peter, he got up and went with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. The day after that, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives and close friends. Okay, putting us back into the context. And by the way, this is my translation of the Greek language. And so it's great for you to have your own Bible open in front of you or your own the device that's got it on. But um, what has happened is that Peter has had an experience before God, but before he did, Cornelius had an experience. And the, corn, the experience Cornelius had was he was praying at three in the afternoon, the ninth hour of the day in their reckoning. He was praying at three in the afternoon, and an angel shows up and says, hey, your prayers and your charitable contributions have been heard before God, and so now go and get Peter. He's going to give you a message of life. He sends his people up there. Well, Peter's well, they're on the way. Peter is getting an experience with God where God is teaching him that the dietary laws have been changed, and that has far, far-reaching implications as Peter is mulling it over. Suddenly, these Gentiles show up at the door, and Peter comes to the conclusion that God's doing far more than just allowing people to eat pork or whatever. He's, he's realizing God's shifting everything in this new thing that he is doing. Uh, it took quite a bit for everyone to get this through their head. We're going to see that as there's councils and everything that come up and criticisms that Peter gets from others in the church for doing what he's doing right now. So he knows he's taking a, a big step forward. So on the next day he got up, went with them. Some of the brothers from Joppa came along. That's good. We find out that there were six of them later on. In Acts chapter 11, uh, during the testimony before the rest of the church, Six brothers from Joppa came along, which was good because that's a lot of witnesses. They needed witnesses to show that everything was done through the Holy Spirit, not just Peter rashly launching out and trying to create his new doctrine. They took two days to get from Joppa up to Caesarea, down, uh, up the coastline, uh, where when Cornelius sent his servants, he sent them after three in the afternoon and they got to Joppa at noon the next day, which means they moved. They were moving. Uh, but it also means they may have had horses and other conveyances because they made it fairly quickly, that 30, 34 miles. And Peter and his group with them on the way back took a full two days. And that means they moved a lot slower, which means they didn't have the conveyances of the horses, apparently, as they went and had to stay over on the road somewhere on the way back to Caesarea. So it took two days from the time they left Joppa to get up there. Cornelius knew that they were coming. They may have had a runner with them. And what that means is, you know, when you get close enough to the city, the runner could take off. And remember, that was one of the ways that messengers worked. So they, they had runners. And so someone who was a runner would take off and run ahead of the crowd and might get there an hour or two early so that Cornelius could have been uh, well prepared to be able to do the, you know, to have Peter in. So Cornelius was planning ahead, knew by then, he, you know, after he sent his servants, he said, when that guy comes back, I'm going to have so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. So -and -so. They weren't practicing social distancing, so they were fine. They could crowd up the house. And so they were able to do what it is that they were able to do. So he invited all of his uh, his relatives and his close friends in to be able to hear. So these guys got back where they needed to be, and then we're told, when Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter raised him to his feet, saying, Stand up, I am also a man myself. After he conversed with him, he went in and found many people gathered together. So there was always a... a, a gate and a courtyard and then the entrance to the house when you were a patrician, when you were, you know, a Roman official, whatever, and, and normal Roman style was always that gate, courtyard, house. And so when Peter entered the house, probably got in that front gate, Cornelius had come out of the other part of the house and ran into him and he gave him veneration. Now, Peter, can you imagine Peter? This is the Galilean fisherman. He walks through the gate 
normally, remember what the Romans had the authority to do? Hey, you, here's my pack, carry it a mile. They had the ability to turn any person in occupied territory into an instant beast of burden. They had absolutely, absolute authority. They could make something up. They were, sometimes they were brutal. They, there were certainly those who would be involved in you know, some sort of graft and extortion. It was just one of the ways that things happen. And it, it usually happens in, in uh, societies. You, know, you always have to fight that in a culture so that people aren't involved in extorting or in taking, being on the take or whatever. And so this was something, as an occupied people, they were not used to the Roman soldiers <laughs> treating them quite this kindly. And so Peter walks in, and this centurion, Cornelius, comes in and prostrates himself right in front of him. Can you imagine? Peter's got to be going, <laughs> this is interesting, reaches down, lifts him up, and gives him a command. It, it's, it's a command which Peter says, stand up. He's giving the centurion an order. This thing is all topsy-turvy. You normally would not do this. You did not use words of command to the Roman soldiers that were around you. Peter was so flummoxed by this, I have no doubt that he just simply, you know, he just, get up. He was horrified. He gave, get up. You know, this isn't something that you need to do. I'm just a human being, just like you are. So you don't need to worship me. And I, I, I figure Cornelius thought if a divine messenger shows up to tell the story of Peter, he certainly, that Peter must be, have some level of, of uh, specialness about him that we need to honor or venerate. Yeah, it's a little bit of Cornelius' background coming out. And so he, you know, you could also uh, venerate a human being by doing this, but that was certainly beyond Peter's ability to handle. By the way, we should really talk about honor versus veneration. Um, when someone, I mean, it's honor to whom honor is due. It's the way it is. We, we honor those to whom honor is due. One of the things that uh, we are told quite clearly in scripture is that we honor those who are involved in government. That's what we do. We, we give them the honor or the respect, and we'd use the word respect, that is due to them. One of the reasons we use the titles of their office is to give them that respect. And we are saying to them, we are giving you this respect because of the office that you hold. And so it also is a way that there is a bit of, um, there's a fostering of obedience. And so all of that is great honor, respect, but veneration crosses the line. And veneration is when you somehow are putting them up as a provider, as you're putting them up as a little bit more special than they really are. The best that any official in government is, is a frail human being just like us. But we honor them because of the role that they are in as they are uh, governing on our behalf, at least in our system, governing on our behalf. And so honoring and veneration are way different when a, an individual begins to require veneration, they put themselves in competition with God. And uh, in North Korea, there's always been this little bit of crossover thing going on where the leaders in North Korea are almost deified. I, I think if you talk to them, they'd say, well, we're really not trying to say that they're gods, but they're, they're, they're really made, you know, there's a veneration toward their leaders um, because of the way that they are just so uplifted. I mean, you know, the, 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 uh, the previous leader, not Kim Jong-un, but the, his father, uh, was said to have played a hole of golf and conquered the game, or a round of golf, had conquered the game because he had holes in one on all 18 holes. Okay, now that's quite the trick, okay? And so you don't need to play the game anymore when you've conquered it at that level. But that was the type of stuff which they would share and with a straight face. That that's the level of genius, physical, acumen, and all of that that is going on right now. And of course, as I mentioned this, I'm well aware of the reports that are coming out of North Korea that uh, Kim Jong-un may not be healthy at this point in time or might even have passed away. Um, that'll be something that we will, you know, hear in the future. And we're certainly not cheering that on by any stretch of the imagination uh, my, our God have mercy on him and on his nation always. So 
But it's interesting in that nation that there was a high level of veneration, or there is a high level of veneration. Not the only nation in the world that does this, but it's the one that is on my mind because of all the news reports that are going on right now. So Peter doesn't allow this to happen. He uh, says, stand up, and then he walks in, and after he has a conversation real quickly with him, probably Cornelius telling him, I've got some friends in there. Uh, They walk in and he he sees all the people that are gathered together, which means that he's going to have an audience. Now, this is one of God's sent apostles who has got an opportunity to share the gospel with a whole bunch of people, and he's certainly ready for it, especially because the Lord prepared him. So, next verses. He told them, all the people that are gathered together, You understand that it is unlawful for a Jewish man to closely associate with a foreigner or to become a close friend with them. But God has shown me not to call any man common or unclean. For this reason, I also came without any objection when I was summoned. Therefore, may I ask for what reason you have sent for me? So there's an uh, an elephant in the room. There just is. And the elephant is Jewish people don't come into Gentile houses. Remember how the Pharisees, when Jesus was going to be crucified, did not want to go into Pilate's house? And so they, they, you know, they, Pilate had to come out to them because they did not want to be unclean. Often they would have gone in, it's just that they wanted to celebrate the Passover, and there's rituals they'd have to go through, and, and they'd have to you know, be immersed in water and all of that stuff to get through the uncleanness because when you walked inside a Gentile's house, you had to assume you were going to become unclean because of the practices of the house, because of the natural uncleanness of of being a Gentile, because they didn't do the immersion thing, they didn't follow the guidelines of staying clean, they touched dead bodies, they ate stuff that would make them unclean. There was all sorts of ways that Gentiles would be unclean ceremonially. So if you went in their house, you were going to become unclean. That was just a given. And they, you know, you you could have, I mean... It wasn't that you had to stay absolutely away from them. It's just that you never went in their house unless you knew that you were going to immediately come out and go through a cleansing, purifying ritual. So Peter says, you understand that it's unlawful or it's against our law. There was an Old Testament line of separation and just the dietary laws separated them. I mean... Um, you just, you know, when you're invited into someone's house, normal hospitality is to eat something. If you were Jewish and invited to dine with the Gentile, you pretty much got to eat the vegetables because you couldn't eat the meat because the meat may have been killed with blood in it. You know, in the Jewish way of killing, of, of making sure the meat was clean, you drain the blood first. And so when you drain the blood, then the meat is, is uh, able, to, and, and it's got to be the, the correct meat, but when you drain the blood first, then you can cook it, and it's, it's appropriate for consumption. Well, even if they had the right meat, they often killed these things, and they didn't drain the blood. So now you were eating blood, and that just wasn't going to work if you were a Jewish person. So there were all sorts of difficulties, and the dietary laws were kind of like the thing which showed it at the highest level, but it wasn't the only thing. And so God had gone after the dietary laws with Peter. Remember the the thing that looked like a giant sail coming down, filled with all sorts of animals, which were unclean, slithery, lizardy, four-footed beasts. You know, in order to eat a four-footed beast, it had to chew the cud and have a split hoof. And so, you, you know, you had some issues there. You, you know, if it didn't chew the cud, you couldn't eat it. So camels were out, split hoof, but they didn't chew the cud. So if you had a camel, you could not have a camel burger. But there were other animals, of course, which had a split hoof and chewed the cud, and that was good for them as long as it was, it was done correctly. But uh, all of those unclean animals had come down before Peter, and God said, none of that's unclean anymore. The implication of that is stunning. It's like Peter's like, man, I can go to McDonald's now. I mean, it changes everything. Just your social interactions change. And right then is when those guys are knocking on the door and Peter's going, man, I, you know, even going into a Gentile's house is going to be different now because of the food no longer being an unclean issue. And suddenly there's some Gentiles at the door and Peter realizes, oh God, you set me up. 
And he goes with them because he understands the implications of all these things. He's getting a new understanding. Um, you know, we're not supposed to associate with you, but God has shown me not to call any man common or unclean. Remember, the word was don't call anything that God, this is about the food, don't call anything that God has cleansed common or unclean. And the word common doesn't say much to us, but what it means is it's not holy. Common is one of the ways you could use the word profane, but I don't even want to, you know, common just means it's not set apart for God's people. That's common. And so they wouldn't eat common, you know, or unclean too. It was common and, and there was unclean. And uh, they, you know, profane would be another thing. Profane is just something which is everyone has. It's, it's profane. It's something that isn't set aside. It would be it's just not, it, it's just too much in common use. It's not holy enough for God. So don't call anything common or unclean anymore. People common or unclean now is included. Peter's making some major uh, shifts in his understanding. And of course, if he's got his understanding changed, he's going he's gonna to do things differently too. That's how God works with us. He changes our understanding so that it changes our behavior. That's key. Pay attention to that. God changes our understanding so that he changes, so that we change our behavior. What we like to do is change people's behavior, whether they have the understanding or not. Do you think it's odd that they get angry about that? When we're trying to change behavior without people having understanding, there will always be pushback whether it's pushback that you can observe or internally there'll be some level of pushback. The idea of conversion through the sword, which was practiced by what is called the church throughout history, and I want to be careful because the true church has never converted with the sword. That's antithetical to the gospel. Now, there were a lot of people who really were the true church in the visible church down through history, and the visible church certainly would convert through the sword. We, you know, there's examples of that throughout history, but that visible church was not the true church, though it certainly had true church members in it. But we don't convert. We preach the gospel. It persuades hearts. People understand God's plan and purpose, and it changes their behavior. It's the same way our behavior was changed. It's the same way God's worked in us. He, he has spoken the word. He put his spirit in our hearts. It's able to get his spirit gives us understanding, and he also works with us so that we can change our behavior. We are saved, and then our behavior changes. Because the Holy Spirit takes up a dwelling place in us. And when we try to flip that around to get people to get their behavior changed before they get saved, you ever hear, you've heard that one before. You know, I can't become a Christian because um, I just don't want to give up this or that. And you go, okay. The real issue is do you understand the invitation that God is extending to you? Because the invitation is to have a relationship with Father God in heaven. And when you have that relationship with Father God in heaven, and you agree that his purposes are the right purposes for your life, the Holy Spirit on the inside will begin to work in you to get rid of all those other things. They lose their luster. They lose their allure. And as a result, people's lives change after they come to Christ. Sometimes it happens at the same time because people are saying, boy, I want to leave this. It's, the, it's the, the picture of the individual saying, I need help. I want to leave this behind. And they receive God with the firm commitment that they want all of that stuff that was in their lives to disappear. Peter understood, and it led him to say, okay, I'll go with you. You know, Let's go spend the night at a Gentile's house. Eat their snacks. Next verses. Then Cornelius explained, four days ago at this very hour, I was praying during the ninth hour, that's 3 p.m., 
at my house when unexpectedly a man stood in front of me in bright clothing. He said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your charitable contributions have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa and summon Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying in the house by the, sea, by the sea as a guest of Simon the Tanner. Okay. Now, by the way, Peter knew this story by now. It had been told to him by the people when they were at the door. He had just spent two days with the three people that Cornelius had sent. What do you think they discussed along the way? This event. And Peter had to explain to them, well, that was an angel and it was sent by God. And he, so everyone knew the story, but Cornelius now is rehearsing it one more time so that everyone in the room is on the same page. And it was a significant event. And so Cornelius was praying and his prayer was interrupted by an angel. The angel said, hey, Cornelius, your prayers and your, your uh, charitable contributions have come up before, as God before a more memorial offering. Why... Does the angel mention the charitable contributions? Because the charitable contributions are a sign that the fact that he feared was a sign of the fact that he feared God. Because when we are giving our finances into something, it's one of the signs that God has changed our hearts. Remember, the first sin is a sin of greed. Adam and Eve wanted something God had said no to. It was a sin of against giving. God had said, you give me the fruit of the harvest of this tree. And they had said, no, we're going to take the harvest. And that's one of the reasons that one of the basic things that we as human beings struggle with, it's, it's a part of our sin nature, is greed. It's why one of the first things that babies say often is, mine because of the fact that they have that nature built into them, and our job is to civilize them and get the Spirit of God into them as they're growing up, if you're a Christian, so that they can be more generous. But fear of God moves us to have less of that greedy grasp. And so the charitable contributions of Cornelius were evidence before the throne of God, that there really was something in his heart that was different. That's not what got God's attention in the sense that, um, you know, here's this pagan guy that doesn't know God. No, 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 he knew God. He was a god fear. He was a pious man. But the charitable contributions are mentioned because it, it was an evidence of the fact that his life had really been changed already. He really was going after God. So um, the angel had come, said, here I am. Send for Peter, and of course Peter gets the invitation to, as he's staying at Simon the Tanner's house. So, Peter is now, he said, tell me why I'm here. They said, here's why you're here. And then verse 33 and 34, 35. So I immediately sent for you, Cornelius says, and you have graciously responded and have come. Now we have all come before God to listen to everything that the Lord has commanded you to share. Then Peter began to speak and said, Beyond all doubt, I understand that God does not discriminate between people groups. He accepts those from every nation who fear him and do what is right. So, huge leap in his understanding. Cornelius obeyed the angel, sent for Peter. Peter says, this is wow. Beyond all doubt, I understand that God doesn't discriminate He's open to every people group or ethnic group. The, the word for nations, which is used here, uh, or people group, and I just, tr it's, it's a word you can translate nations, is the Greek word ethnos. It means nations or people group. It's our word ethnic. We talk about ethnic groups. It's the same thing. It's an ethnic group is a people group that often came from a particular nation. And so God does not discriminate. Peter says that as clearly as you can say it. God does not differentiate. God doesn't hold prejudices against people groups. It's an individual person thing all the time. And he accepts those from every nation who fear him and do what is right. That's, you know, as Peter's just explaining the whole thing. By the way, in, in Colossians chapter 3, 
verses 10 and 11. This is Paul's understanding of the church. Uh, everyone who has put off the old self and put on the new self, he says, you have put on the new self that is being renewed in knowledge in accord with the image of its creator where there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised, that's a D, <laughs> pretend, or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is everything and in everyone. Christ is everything in, in everyone in the church, whether they're your Greek or Jew, whether you've been someone who is circumcised, which is under the covenant of the Jewish people, or uncircumcised, you weren't a part of the covenant of the Jewish people, whether you are a barbarian, and by the way, that was a people group, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is everything and in everything. By the way, you know how the word barbar how barbarians got their name, barbarian? Because when they attacked the Romans, they would say the barbarians. And it was often the Germanic hordes and the northern European hordes that they'd be fighting. And they'd be coming down, running the mountain, down the mountain, screaming and yelling. And to the Romans, it sounded like they were yelling, bar, 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 as they were running down the mountain screaming and yelling. So they were the barbarians. So there you go. You can check that out to see if it's actually a myth, but it's a fun one. And I had a professor tell me it. So there, we had to, you know. <laughs> and he is a professor of history. So I'm taking him at his word for that one. Ah, just came back to me. I had the whole scene of the classroom in my head, had to share it. So Anyway, he accepts those from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Those who fear him, who do what is right. That's interesting. He accepts people from every nation who fear him. And then what happens is their fear of God, which becomes a, a, an honor and respect and a love, because anything that you give yourself to, that's love. Love is sacrificial in nature. And he, 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 that moves you to start to live for him, to try to seek his ways. So you can figure out how to be able to serve him. Romans 1, chapter 20. We're told, For from the creation of the world, his invisible qualities, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood by what was created so that they have nothing to present in their defense, those who reject God. That's why they have nothing. Remember the heavens declare the glory of God? The heavens are crying out day and night. Paul later on when he's talking about this in Romans says that the, the skies, the heavens, all of creation cry out God's glory. Now, there's a couple of ways that you can respond to what God is crying out. By the way, if you wonder why creation is under attack all the time, why the evolutionists are trying to undercut always the idea of creation, it's because they're trying to silence one of God's voices. If, if we're just accidents that came into being and there's actually no real purpose or creation just happened, I mean, there was nothing and then it exploded into something. If that was all by chance or accident, there's no voice. And so the reason that evolutionists, atheistic evolutionists, are, are constantly against the idea of creator or first cause and it's not even rational at this point in time. If you're a scientist who believes in a young earth or a young, a young universe, you get blackballed right away. Even though you've got the scientific evidence, it doesn't matter. It's a religion. It's a belief system that will not allow dissent. It's not science, because science is always allowing dissent. Whenever someone says the science is settled, they are demonstrating they don't even begin to understand what science is. Because science is never settled. Science is hypothesis, observation, hypothesis, and proving or disproving. Through observation and experiment. Science is never settled. So when someone says the science is settled, they have a little stamp that they're putting on their forehead. I don't understand what science is. I could have said something stronger, but the Spirit of God helped me. <laughs> Okay, because the, they're, they're saying something nonsensical. It's just simply saying, I believe this, and I don't want to hear any of your thoughts on it, no matter what. 
It's the same thing that has happened every time. There is a shift going on in human opinion. It, it goes back to, is the Earth the center of the, the galaxy, is the, or the, of the solar system, or is the sun the center? And there were people who believed that the Earth was the center of not only just the, the solar system, but the galaxy and the universe, and there was a discussion, and we don't want to hear about your evidence. And that's the same thing. Whenever someone says, I don't, we don't need to hear any more evidence, they're saying, I am an obscuritanist. I'll stop there. Okay, there we go. I, I'm just pointing out the, the ludicrous nature of what's going on around us often. And they try to make people believe that it's science to say the science is settled. settled. No, it's obscuritanism. It's, it's uh, demonstrating that the people are either ignorant or evil. One or the other. So... Graciously, we'll just say ignorant. There we go. So, Peter talking about the fact that God wants to be able to help those who acknowledge him and who do what is right. It says he sent this message that he's not a discriminate nor to tor- he's not a discriminant. He's not a God who's into discrimination. Good. He sent this message to the people of Israel. He proclaimed the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord of everyone. Okay. So what Peter is saying is, this is what Jesus was trying to get through our thick skulls the entire time that he was with us, and we were a bit slow. Because God sent this message of accepting everyone to the people of Israel. They didn't get it. He then sent Jesus with that good news of peace between God and everyone, and they didn't get that. But you need to know, Jesus is Lord of everyone, not just the Jewish people, not just the people who accept the Mosaic Code. And so this is a very powerful verse of Scripture. This message was sent to the people of Israel. Jesus has brought it to them also. By the way, when did he do it? He did it in a lot of different ways, like uh, telling the um, centurion that he had a faith greater than anyone in Israel a centurion who was not under the law of Moses, or a Syrophoenician woman, for that matter. And and when he told the story of the centurion in Matthew chapter 8, it says, when Jesus heard, that was when the centurion said, just send your servant, you can heal my, you know, just say the word, and you can heal my servant. When Jesus heard that, he was astonished and said to those who were following him, truly I tell you, I have not found faith such as this in anyone in Israel, and I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And he's not talking about people in the east and west who are under the Mosaic Code. He was, and in fact, he makes it very clear in the next verse, he's not talking about that. He's saying the Gentiles are going to come in. Jesus was the one who was sending this message in a variety of different ways. He's the one that brought the message that the message of God's life in Jesus is for everyone, and Jesus is Lord of everyone. By the way, that title, um, Curious Pontus, Lord of Everyone, is or Pontu, is uh, the phrase that the Gentiles would use to speak of deity. So as Peter uses this phrase in a Gentile household, he is saying this, he's, he's deity. It's a strong message of deity. So, now he's said, you know, Jesus, he's the Lord of everyone. And that is a message of deity. And so he goes, and he's just, the last verses for today, because this is a long section, so we're dividing it up. The last verses for today, he says, you yourselves know the things that happened through all of Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism, which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went everywhere doing good and healing everyone who was oppressed by the devil because God was with him. And so Peter says, by the way, Jesus is the one who brought this message. And oh, by the way, he's deity. And oh, by the way, you all know because you're in Caesarea, which is right next to Palestine or a part of it, right next to Israel, Galilee, Samaria. You're all right here. You knew what he was doing when he was out doing it. He's just going to rehearse and make sure they're all on the same page. But they certainly knew about Jesus. Everybody knew about Jesus. There was an, he was an amazing miracle worker. He was well known for his activities. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. Now that's critical. Being anointed with the Holy Spirit gave him the ability to hear God at a high level. We often think, and and if you've been around here 
long enough, you know that um, it's clear in Scripture that Jesus did not use his divine prerogatives. It says in the book of Luke that he was walking around with some people and the power of God was there for him to heal the sick, which by very definition means there were times the power of God was not there for him to heal the sick because he didn't need that type of power all the time because there weren't sick people around or there weren't people that God was intending that he target. Uh, There wasn't the spectacular thing that was supposed to happen, whatever. Jesus, for the first 30 years of his life, did not walk in divine power. He wasn't baptized by John. When he was baptized by John, the heavens opened up and the Spirit came down, and he was baptized by the Holy Spirit and with power, and he began his miraculous ministry based upon the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's why he could live in our place, because he did not cheat. Cheating would be turning stones into bread to feed himself instead of trusting the Father and the Holy Spirit to be able to take care of him. That's cheating. If he had the divine ability and used it, that's cheating. And he wouldn't have been able to stand in as our replacement any longer. If Jesus used his divine prerogatives to discern what was going on around him, that's cheating. And he would have forfeited his ability to stand in for us. He had to live totally as one of us, under the law, as dependent as any of us. So when he left the Father's throne and became one of us, he set aside all of his divine prerogatives, and he became so dependent, he needed not only you know, the angels to watch over him, but a human female to nurse him, feed him, and change his diapers. That's about as dependent as you can get. And he was protected and nurtured. And at 30 years of age, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit and in power, and his ministry began, but he was still absolutely dependent upon the Father and the Holy Spirit to communicate with him, direct him. He said, I only do what I see the Father doing. I'm not making my own choices. I have to listen. That's the tree of life, by the way. You want to know what the difference between the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is? Jesus clearly points it out. I only do what I see the Father doing. I don't get up and say, hey, there's you know, a couple of good choices for me today. I'm going to figure out logically which one fits. No, Father, which one is the right one? And if we're not hearing from God, that's how we have to do it, but we always got to ask God first. Say, Lord, what, is there any path you want me to take today? And generally speaking, we don't hear very much because God wants us to be good, mature sons and daughters of the king who are able to walk and understand, discern his purposes for us. But when we really come down to a time where we have to make decisions, we say, Lord, please direct me, please guide me. And we may use logic. We may use the different ways of doing things, but we've prayed and we've asked God to release his light to us first. That's the tree of life. And if we first go to the let's decide logically without asking God to touch it, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil also gives you the knowledge of good, not just evil. But it's not the path. The path is, God, will you please help me as I make this decision and inform my opinion. That's the tree of life. So anyway, he was going around. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he did good, and he healed everyone. Now, he did good. What's, you know, healing? You know, you could call resurrections a healing, right? You reanimate the body, that's a type of healing. But what's doing good? And you think about some of the doing good things he did by driving out demons, by feeding people who needed help when they were out in the wilderness. He wouldn't do that, um, by the way, to enable them. In John 6, they showed up and they said, hey, we want you to feed us again. He said, no. You go out and you you earn your own money and you make your own food. That's a... That's a jarring statement, isn't it? I don't think there's any food banks that have that over their door. And I'm not saying food banks are wrong. I'm just simply saying when Jesus does that, it's like, what? You know, the secular world believes the only thing the church is good for is to help the poor and feed the poor. You know, and, that, and Jesus in John 6 has all these people come say, hey, we want you to feed us. He says, no, I'm not doing that. You need to work for food that will last, spiritual food. And all you're doing is wanting to make me into a bread king. I'm not doing that. And so when the world just wants to make us into a food feeding feeding program, 
It, it's not the purpose of the church at its highest level. It is one of the auxiliary things we do because we want to alleviate suffering, but it's not our primary purpose. But when the world looks at us, by the way, if you're about to have an argument with the world, you've got to point to those things that you do as a church so that they, because they don't have any other grid work. They don't, you know, you pray, who cares? You uh, fellowship, who cares? Ah, but we do this that impacts our culture. Okay, now you're talking to me because they don't understand. But Jesus, he, he always did things that would make us like, we'd look and go what? But he was doing good. And he did things for people. You know, that, that's something we can certainly emulate because we can do good. And we can do everything we can to alleviate pain and suffering. One of the reasons we pray for healing so much is we want people to be healed without all the pain and suffering. And, you know, we've seen some really incredible things, but, you know, we've got a long way to go to really go after things in prayer so that people are healed. But when Peter's talking to this group of people, he's saying, you know, you guys know all about what Jesus did. You know his message. His message is that God is there for you. And he went around doing good. God still does good, and he still does good through his people so that it draws attention. And people can see that God's a God who doesn't discriminate. We may be people who discriminate because of our fallibility, but God's infallible. I will be talking more about this next week as we see what happens next with Cornelius and Peter and the group gathered in front of them. And it's about to get very much fun in that house. So we'll talk more about that next week. Right now, let's just pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to gather together today in this strange circumstance that we find ourselves in our United States of America and in the world today. I ask that you would guide us and help us and be with us and open the eyes of our hearts so that we can grow beyond our own prejudices, so that we can grow beyond our own way of looking at the world that is not your way of looking at the world so that we can draw quick understanding, like Peter did, to the ways that you are shaping and moving us. I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Hey, to our streamers, thanks for being with us today. And uh, Friday night, 7.30, you can come back and stream again. God bless.